It is Monday, May 9th, 2022, and this is Professor Hassey <clears throat> coming to you live and in color from Claremont, California. And this is week six of Business 330 Business Finance. We continue with our capital budget analysis this week. We practice a capital budget problem in assignment number three, due on Sunday, May 15th. An additional twist to, to the assignments this week, in addition to the main assignment problem, there's also some extra credit problems for students to do to earn some extra credit points to go towards their grade. If you've missed an assignment or you did poorly on an assignment, or even if you just wanna bulk up your grade, uh, this week there's three extra credit problems included in the assignment. You do not have to do them, but if you do do them and do them correctly, you'll be awarded 20 extra points as extra points to your grade point uh, average calculation. So please take note of that in assignment number three. The next two assignments, this week assignment three and next week assignment four, which will be about risk and return and cost of capital, all will also have additional extra credit questions that you can do. <clears throat> Tonight, our topic is the assignment number three plus uh, some chapters 10, 11, and 12. We're gonna talk more specifically about chapter 12 next week, but this week, project analysis, the break-even analysis of a company. When do you start making money? And a definition of risk and return from chapter 11. How do we measure, how do we determine risk and return and investment? So that's our topics for this evening here on our course lecture video for week number six, Capital Budgeting Analysis. Okay, let me just refresh some things that we discussed last week, more specifically in our lecture videos and problems in chapter eight and nine. <coughs> and this is what we're doing in our assignment three this week. First of all, we learned about how to determine the return of an investment in year zero and the cash flow that is being generated off that investment, the definition of cash flow being net income, plus or minus uh, salvage value, depreciation, working capital. And that net cash flow is then is determined the return on the investment by four different methods. The net present value method by determining the discount of the future cash flows by the cost of capital for that particular project. The internal rate of return by measuring the percentage or the percentage return from year zero to the length of the project. And the profitability index, taking the discounted cash flow and comparing it to the amount of investment in a ratio. And then how long does it take us to recoup the investment dollars over the cash flow period in years? Net present value, internal rate of return, profitability index and payback. Then we looked at the chapter nine problem, which is ways of actually calculating and determining the cash flows generated off an investment. In this problem, the investment was $45,000 depreciated over four years. The revenues were uh, 40, 30, 20, and 10,000. Expenses were 40% of uh, revenues. And we determined with the tax rate and the working capital calculations and the depreciation being back in, added back in, there was our net cash flow. And then that net cash flow was used to determine the net present value, the internal rate of return, the profitability index, and the payback. You're doing something very similar uh, to that in this week's assignment number three. Uh, and I'm also giving you the spreadsheet template and all you have to do is figure out and put, put in the numbers into the template and then do the arithmetic calculations. So let's take a look at assignment number three. So here is assignment number three located in the assignments and examinations file folder in Blackboard. I've given you two versions, a Word doc and a PDF version for you to download and look at the format, but all the work, all the work done on this assignment is to be in the spreadsheet file provided 
uh, in Blackboard along in that assignment number three file folder. So you are to download, don't, excuse me, download that file folder and do all your work in that file folder, including the extra credit work if you desire to do that. So we'll see that in just a minute. But basically, this is a problem that's very similar, but not exactly. You got to do a little bit of thinking. <clears throat> very similar to the question, the problems we reviewed in chapter eight and nine. It's a capital budget analysis, or I ask you to determine the net present value, the internal rate of return, the profitability index, and the payback in years with the data and information given to you in this problem. And then when you're all done with that and you have your final return numbers, you are just to write in that spreadsheet of analysis, is this project in your determination based on the data that you calculated a go or a no-go on the project? Should the company go ahead with funding that project or should they say, nah, nah I don't think so. Go or no-go, don't forget to put that answer into your analysis. <clears throat> so the cost of capital for this analysis is 9%. That's your discount rate. That's the rate you use to determine the discounted cash flow. The investment in year zero is $750,000. <clears> the project life is five years. It's being depreciated at $150,000 a year. And then in the final year, there's a salvage value of $25,000. The working capital base of annual sales is 10%. In other words, you take the sales in year one, that drives year zero a working capital, and so on throughout the project. The working capital base is 10% of annual sales. Remember, working capital has to be netted out to zero during the life of the project. The tax rate of the project is 22%. They're going to sell 40,000 units a year. The selling price per unit is $40 a unit. There's your revenue. The fixed operating costs are $175,000 a year for the five years. And the variable cost per unit or the variable costs are $30 per unit. So there's your expenses. So now what you do is you take this information and you download the spreadsheet that I have provided. And here is that spreadsheet. Notice the format is all set up for you. You just have to fill in the information in the appropriate cell and do the appropriate arithmetic to determine the net cash flow. <clears throat> then you go ahead and do the net present value, <clears throat> the internal rate of return, the profitability index, and the payback, just like we did in chapters eight and nine and give me that information and then you tell me go or no go for this project. So again, you put the investment here, you put your revenue here, your variable costs, your fixed costs, your depreciation. Notice these costs will all be the same every year. There's no <clears throat> inflation rate in this problem. Your tax rate is 22%. There's your net income. You add back in salvage value, but remember, salvage value is a gain of $25,000 at the end of the life of the project. You have fully depreciated, so is that gain a capital gain and needs to be taxed? You need to determine that. Here's your depreciation line, your working capital line, and your net cash flow line. Remember, working capital is what you have to expend based on the first year's annual revenue, <clears throat> and that has to zero out to zero at the end of its life. In this case, there's no change in revenue during the life of the, of the project, so do you need to put working capital in in the various years, or you just add back that amount in year zero in year five? <clears throat> you have to determine that. And you will come up with the project cash flow. Oops, I forgot to put a zero there. Let's do that. Project cash flow. And then you can do your discounted cash flow at a 9% discount rate and do the following information. And I want to see the calculations in those cells, just like we did in chapter eight and chapter nine. That is your assignment. That's the assignment. A three is to fill in this spreadsheet with all the data, and then post this back to Blackboard. 
I will not accept PDFs. I will not accept Word. Everything has to be in a spreadsheet. If you're uncomfortable with using this template, you can create your own spreadsheet if you'd like on Google Docs, on, on Microsoft uh, Works, on, uh, on Numbers, excuse me, and in anything else. But I need to see a spreadsheet of your analysis to give me net cash flow for years one through five and these return analysis. That's what I'm looking for in assignment three. Pattern off the templates from eight and nine. In addition, you have extra credit in the assignment three, as I mentioned earlier. That, <clears throat> that extra credit is on pages two and three, and it's three problems, all from chapter 10, which is your reading this week, all from chapter 10 this week, extra credit. And again, you do not have to do these if you don't. If you get a portion of them right or a portion of all the answers right, there's 20 points here. Let's say you get half of it right, you'll get 10 points. If you get a quarter of it right, you'll get five points. If you get them all right, you'll get 20 points added as extra points to your work thus far in the course. So the first question is the definition of capital budget, true or false for each one of these four questions. The second question is your explanation and determination of fixed and variable costs for this company. So those are answers to each one of these questions. True and false, short answer. And then in the, the third extra credit is to calculate the break-even point in sales, in number of units, and, and dollars. Two, what is the break-even point in units, in this case, diamonds, and what is the break-even point of that amount in dollars? I need to see those two calculations based on this data given here, and this is all from chapter 10, and we'll look at a PowerPoint of this work in just a minute. So those are the extra credit, and they are also located in that spreadsheet I have given you. And here is that spreadsheet. If you go to the extra credit tab, you'll see the answers that you can put in for question one, true or false for those four questions, the short answer questions of question two, A, B, C, D, and E, and the break even analysis in units and in dollars for those two questions in question three. These are for 20 extra credit points to be used to add to your grade average thus far. You don't have to do them if you don't want to, but you'll be doing some of these for a real grade in assignment number four <clears throat> next week. Extra credit all on the spreadsheet. Again, don't give me the extra credit in a Word or PDF document. <clears throat> it has to be on this spreadsheet for you to get credit. So again, <clears throat> assignment number three is located in the assignments and examinations file folder. <clears throat> There's the spreadsheet that you right click and download to use. There's the work and you are to post it to this file folder, <coughs> excuse me, by next Sunday evening, May 8, excuse me, that's May 15th, next Sunday evening, May 15th at midnight and I'll correct that. But here's the folder, the answer folder that you will use. Okay, here's our Blackboard site, and this is week number six. <clears throat> There's our learning assignments for this week, this lecture video, which is going to be posted a little bit later today. Uh, chapter 10, project analysis. Chapter 11, risk and return. Chapter 12, cost of capital. We'll be concentrating mainly on 10 and 11 tonight and my, uh, because 10 is involved in the extra credit of the assignment. And then we'll talk about uh, chapter 12 uh, on our Friday or our weekend update video. So we open up the week six file folder. You'll see our agenda. You'll see a video that I'd like you to watch that kind of explains capital budgeting. It's only two minutes long, shouldn't take long. And then our topics, uh, things you need to know from week six, 
break-even analysis from chapter 10, operating leverage from chapter 11, cost of capital, measuring risk, and diversification of chapter 12. And this is where beta comes into play. Remember one of the questions on our last assignment, uh, the midterm, or excuse me, it's, uh, yeah, the midterm where I ask you to find the beta of your companies in your portfolio. Uh, we'll talk about beta from chapter 12. Our financial fact this week is the weighted average cost of capital, which we'll be learning in chapter 12. The cost of doing business, this is the discount rate uh, that you're using in your assignment number three this week. Then the PowerPoints explaining the key parts of chapters 10, 11, and 12. And uh, some review problems that I will talk about a little bit on Friday or on the weekend video. So let's take a look at chapters 10 and 11 and the key points that you need to be aware of from your reading of those chapters. Another way of reviewing the return of a capital investment or an asset investment, one way is to do a return analysis, which you're doing in assignment three, which we talked about last week, project analysis of determining NPV, IRR, <clears throat> profitability index, and payback in years. Another way of doing a project analysis of whether it's a decent project is to do a break-even analysis. And this is discussed in chapter 10 and part of our extra credit problems on the assignment this week is the break-even analysis. And many, many of you maybe have studied this already in high school or in other economics or business classes. The break-even analysis is at what point in our sales do we cover all our costs? And thus, when you cover all your costs, you're breaking even, you have zero profit. This is an explanation of it here in this slide. The break-even is revenues minus Two ty three types of expenses. And we run into these three types of expenses now in our assignment three. Variable expenses, where expenses that change with the output and the volume level of your business. Fixed expenses, with do not change with output. They stay the same consistently year to year. And then you have your depreciation expenses. In the case of this problem here, the break even in dollars is $11,667 because at that point in time, that's when all the variable, fixed, and depreci depreciation costs are covered and our profit is zero. So that's the break even analysis. It's that level of analysis when we cover all of our expenses. And the break even analysis is, is basically another way of looking at a project. How much, uh, how much return do we expect to generate? What's the cost, their various costs of that uh, idea? And do we cover and when, at what point does that talk about? And a lot of it, the break-even analysis has to do with operating leverage. At what point in time do you cover those fixed costs? Because if you're a highly leveraged company, that means you have a lot of fixed costs. Fixed costs mean interest expense, costs that do not change. You can sell one unit or a million units, you still have those fixed costs. Whereas the variable costs will be lower if you're only producing one unit compared to producing one million units. So the leverage of a company is driven by the fixed costs. The higher that fixed cost, the higher the degree of operating leverage, thus, that takes the company longer to achieve profits. One of the first things that companies do when they try to lower their cost of doing business is get rid of their and lower their fixed costs because that allows them to get to profitability quicker. That's why many times companies will keep their hourly staff, but they'll cut their salaried staff because they're more expensive, more expensive and they'll try to lower their leverage, they lower their fixed costs by reducing the number of fixed costs or salaried employees. That's one of the first things you try to do. And that's what operating leverage is. Whenever you hear that expression, oh, that company is highly leveraged. It means they have a very, very high amount of fixed costs. And fixed costs are usually two costs in a company, interest expenses on debt, 
if you have a lot of debt, you're going to have a lot of interest. And salary or expenses that do not change or are affected by volume, they're going to be there no matter what. So that's what fixed costs are and operating leverage. Going back to our definition of, of break even a point, if you take those costs that do not change based on volume, fixed costs and depreciation, and you divide that by the contribution margin, the contribution margin is the difference between selling price per unit and variable costs per unit. So let's say my uh, selling price per unit is a dollar and my uh, variable costs are 40 cents. A dollar minus 40 cents means my contribution margin is 60 cents a unit. That's what that means here, 60 cents. It's the relationship between selling price and variable costs. Those are all per unit numbers. So if I divide that contribution margin into the amount of fixed costs and depreciation I have to cover, that gives me my break-even point. In this case, they have to sell $10 million of profit excuse me, of product to cover all the variable and fixed costs. Fixed costs plus depreciation divided by contribution margin will give us our break even point in dollars. And then you divide that by the number of units and the selling price per unit, and you can get the number of units you have to sell to break even. One of the first things that business managers or financial managers look at uh, on a month to month basis is when they get their sales figures uh, at the end of every month, they can determine by just looking at that sales volume, whether they made money or not. They don't need a quick and dirty income statement or a financial statement. They know their margins. They know their fixed costs and depreciation costs. They know all those, they know how many units they have to sell in order to break even. And they can immediately know that during the course of an operating month. It's a very important way of measuring the success of an asset, break-even analysis. A little bit more specific analysis is naturally what we're doing in chapter eight and nine, and that's taking a look at net present value, internal rate of return, profitability index, and payback. Those are four solid methods of calculating project viability, but break-even analysis is a quick and dirty way of determining how we're doing with a particular investment. Another important way of determining or measuring the, uh, the attractiveness of an investment is looking at the rates of return, the percentages of return. For example, a rates of return can be taking a capital gain off an investment and adding any dividend income you made off that investment and dividing it by the cost of the investment. So in this case, let's say I made a gain of $142.75, gain means when I sold this stock, I made a profit of 142.75. I add into that any additional dividend income I, re I received from that investment. And then I divide it by the price that I paid for that investment. And in this case, whoa, it's a 98.5% return on my investment. That's a percentage return. Another ways of looking at return are dividend yield, which is how much income I'm generating off an investment. And then also combining that with the capital gain yield, when I do sell the investment, that again is another way of looking at rates of return. So what a lot of investors look at, especially if they're investing in a company's capital assets, is what those capital assets produce in the form of capital gains or makes the stock price grow. What kind of dividends the company will pay off the re cash flow of that return on investment. So rates of return are very important because rates of return are how we measure beta in chapter 12. R rates of return are a, a comparison of the rate of return on an investment compared to the rate of return of the market. And that variance or standard deviation determines the beta of a company. And that's what we'll talk about in chapter 12 in our weekend update video. Here's a dividend of member using the example we were in early, earlier, we paid $150.71 for a stock. We had a dividend of 568. That's a dividend yield of 
We had a capital gain of $142.75 compared to the price of that. That means we had a 94.7% capital gain yield. The combination of dividend yield and capital gain gives us our total return or total rate of return, which is was the 98.5%. So investors look at this. Dividend yield is a yield that you can get at all times during the course of an investment because you're paying, getting paid dividends during the, during the regular operating year of an investment. Capital gain yield is only when you're, we actually sell the asset to get the gain. But sometimes people determine capital gain yields by taking a snapshot, let's say, like we just did. Take the value of your portfolio at a given point in time. Ooh. We lost some money. So at this point, even though we haven't sold the stock, we might be having a negative yield because the stock price went from our valuation went from 100,000. And in the case of Professor Hassey went to $88,000. Thus, I had a negative capital gain yield, but it's not really a gain yet or loss because I haven't sold it. But at this point in time, it tells me that my portfolio is not doing very good. So these are all information that's defined in Chapter 11, it talks about the market indexes, something that you've been working on and we've had some uh, definitions throughout the first few weeks of our course, markets of the Dow, the S&P 500, these all indicate market returns. That's why you're keeping these calculations in your portfolio during the course of these eight weeks. You're determining your return of your portfolio, comparing that to the return of the markets the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ, because that's where you can get a good idea of how you're doing vis-a-vis -vis the overall industry of stocks. Since 1900 through 2017, here's the overall return of three key investments, equities, stock, bonds, and treasury bills, lending money to the government. Notice by far, from 1900 through 2017, and this has continued, stocks are, for, are the greatest investment that you can make over a long, over a period of time. Why? Because there's more risk involved. You better be getting those high returns because if, if you don't get those returns, you're losing your money. Where in the case of bonds and treasury bills, those are, they, they have to pay you. They will pay you because if they go into default, they have to sell off assets and you're still gonna get paid. So the risk in those investments is a lot less, but the higher the risk is in stocks. So that means they have to perform, they have to find assets that they invest in that drives huge, or not huge, but good returns to drive the capital gains of equities. And that's why the stock market, historically speaking, outperforms all the other vehicles because the risk is greater. They have to perform or you're not gonna be buying their stock. And that goes back to why we do this investment analysis in chapters eight, nine, and 10. We're looking at investing in assets that are going to give us over costs, substantial returns so we can encourage more capital coming into the company. And that's why companies raise money in the stock market because the investors know that usually they'll make a nice return on their investment over the long haul. Now, buying a stock for one day and thinking you're gonna make a lot of money is out of the question. You buy equities, you buy stock in companies for ownership over a long period of time. If the companies do what they say they're going to do by investing in assets and providing returns, which you are measuring with NPV, IRR, and the like, you'll be investing and getting those good returns in stocks. And that leads us into the discussions of chapter 12 when we take a look at what is called the capital asset pricing model. Please pay, pay a tick particular attention to that in your reading in chapter 12. The capital asset pricing model is a way of measuring in percent based on the risk in the market beta of determining the expected return off a of stock. So if I want to buy Apple computer tomorrow on the market, I want to kind of get an idea what Apple is going to be do returning for me or what do I have to return from Apple in order to make a decent investment in that company. It's based on the risk in the market, beta. It's based on the risk in the market of the indexes. 
combination of all those will give me an idea what I expect to earn off Apple stock. And we'll talk about that in our weekend video at the end of this week. So the key things to get out of our discussion tonight is first of all, be comfortable and understand the format of assignment number three, where you have to do a capital budget analysis, put it in the spreadsheet provided, and also there's some extra credit work. Secondly, what is the definition of the break-even point? At what point in volume and in dollars do we cover all our costs, variable expenses, fixed expenses, and depreciation? When we do cover those costs, how many do we have to sell to break even? And that determines our operating leverage. The higher the fixed cost, the higher the depreciation, the greater the leverage or operating leverage of the company means you cannot get to profitability as quickly as you want. And then finally, from chapter 11, the definition of risk and return, <coughs> a combination of dividend and, and capital gain yield of showing us how an investment performs over time of what it generates for us in comparison to what we paid for that investment. All this ties in to our capital budget analysis. So practice and do assignment three this week. I will be available on Wednesday evening to answer any questions. If you do not understand why and how to use the spreadsheet, please get in touch with me because this is part of the assessment and the learning of this class is for you to do analysis in a spreadsheet format, just like we're doing in assignment three and assignment four next week, all spreadsheets. All right, everybody, have a great week. We'll talk to you as the week goes along. Have a good one. Adios.